Chicago Tonight, Latino Voices, is made possible in part by CIBC. Good evening and bienvenidos to Chicago Tonight, Latino Voices. I'm Hugo Valta, WTTW News Director and your host. Thank you for spending part of your weekend with us. Tonight, a Voices crossover event will begin a conversation about the relationship between Chicago's black and Latino communities, the challenges and opportunities, and then continue the conversation in tomorrow night's Black Voices. Hoy es el Día de la Virgen de Guadalupe, a look at the origins of the religious holiday. Combating food insecurity in the Chicago area, a discussion on the stigma that still surrounds it. As Pilsen battles over a controversial landmark district proposal, we look back at the beginnings of gentrification in that neighborhood. And Pasión Latina, a concert at Lyric Opera of Chicago unlike anything you've ever heard. First off tonight, this summer we watched with apprehension as tensions between black and Latino Chicagoans threatened to explode into violence into the largely Latino communities of Little Village and Pilsen. Activists ran into action to restore peace between the groups, but the incident underlined an uneasy history between our city's black and Latino communities. There's a lot to talk about, so this weekend we've asked a panel of guests to join us for two discussions. We'll begin the first part tonight in a moment, and tomorrow Brandis will host a continued conversation which will air on Chicago Tonight, Black Voices. Joining us are Sylvia Puente, Executive Director of the Nonpartisan Latino Policy Forum, Berto Aguayo, Executive Director of the anti-violence organization Increase the Peace, Laura Washington, Chicago Sometime columnist and ABC7 political analyst, and Todd Belcourt, Co-Founder and Executive Director of the National Nonprofit Social Change. Thank you to all for joining us. Berta, let's start with you. We saw tensions erupt this summer in some of, some of the neighborhoods when reports of Latino gang members threatening ass to assault black people in their neighborhood, prompting first an outcry and then show of unity. What are activists doing now to maintain that unity? Um, I think one of the things that we've done as activists is uh, to deal and grapple with a simple truth. And that simple truth is to acknowledge that in certain pockets of, of the Latino community, there does exist anti-black sentiment. And also likewise, in certain pockets of the black community, there does exist a certain um, anti-Latino sentiment. Um, and what we've seen is acknowledging that truth, having those tough conversations and healing through action. Um, over the summer and the aftermath of the riots, we saw black and brown unity food pantries. We, we organized black and brown unity rallies and we organized a black and brown unity car parade where hundreds of cars displaying Pan-African flags, Mexican flags paraded throughout the South side in a show of unity because we need to acknowledge um, that we are stronger to get together and we can't be fighting one another. Instead, we need to fight the system that's oppressing us both. Um, and it is these actions at the grassroots level that have united black and brown organizers, black and brown residents, um, that really give me hope that we are paving a new way and a new era of black and brown coalition building in the city. Humberto, in order to, to understand what's happening right now, you have to understand a little bit of, of the history. Sylvia, the two largest groups of Latinos in Chicago, Mexican and Puerto Ricans, began migrating to Chicago from the 1910s to the 1930s. Can you give us some historical perspective on what that, their experience was settling here in Chicago? Well, basically, during that era, let, let me point out that the very first settlement was actually in the late 1800s, when the very first Mexican consulate was established in Chicago. And our first quote unquote Mexican neighborhood in Chicago was in Southeast Chicago. And people came to work on the railroads, to work in the steel mills and to work in the stockyards. And those are where you see, where you see Latinos and older Latino settlements in those areas, to your point from the times to the thirties, even into the fifties and the sixties. Um, and that really was, I think the genesis of primarily Mexican migration to Chicago uh, beginning to be fueled in the late 50s and 60s by Puerto Rican migration, where we have the same patterns of firms going to uh, cities in Mexico and in Puerto Rico to recruit literally strike breakers. Uh, because remember, this is a time in an era where we were sitting longer days. We didn't have the eight hour day in place. And many families uh, came to Chicago literally to work in 
in those arenas literally as like strike breakers. If, and uh, uh, of course, when we talk about history, uh, no, no community like the black Americans who have transformed Chicago uh, have helped shape some of that history. Laura, in other northern cities, when they began moving to the cities during the Great Migration beginning in 1960, can you tell us a little bit more about the black communities experiencing experiences moving here? Well, they, they, they moved here because they were, they were seeking a better life. It's just that simple. Uh, there was, they were also escaping from racism, overt racism in the South. So many African-Americans came to Chicago, for example, uh, for those reasons. Uh, there were jobs here. There were factories opening up here. Uh, but when they came here, they found that they were just as segregated in many ways, just as oppressed as they had been in the South. The interesting thing about black right migration to Chicago is that it happened in Two, two, way, two ways earlier in the 20th century, you saw black migration that, that, that headed primarily for the South side of Chicago and, and, and many of those folks moved to the black belt, which at that time and for many decades after that was a very thriving, the area around Bronzeville, for example, very thriving economically, socially, culturally, but it was, it was black people were very much hemmed in in that community. In later years, when blacks started to begin to spread into other neighborhoods, you saw a, another wave of African Americans come from come from the South that went to the West Side. The, the, those African Americans tended to come later than the folks that settled in the South Side. And in many ways, there's differences culturally between those two groups. But the big issue is, is, is I think we know from Black Latino relations or the challenges around it is segregation because African Americans were primarily in the South Side. Uh, in the west side, Latinos tended to migrate more to the southwest side, northwest side, and so there weren't a lot of opportunities uh, for us to get to know each other and to live together, and that I think is one reason why we, we had some of these underlying conflicts that, that you mentioned earlier in the show. Yeah, and certainly, look, economy is a motivating factor for any community uh, to want to, to migrate. Todd, how would you say that these deferring histories in Chicago affect relationships between the communities today? I think it goes to both Berto and Laura's point. Uh, the notion of no population has a monopoly on bias. Every every ethnicity has some sort of sentiments of bias that expresses itself differently. But I think it's very clear within the black and brown communities, we do have a common history of being exploited. We do have a common history of having our, our land robbed and, and being ripped away from our families. So we have too much in common not to come together. So what happens is when you have things like segregation, which Laura mentioned, it doesn't just segregate us in terms of getting access to jobs and education, it also segregates from one another for keeping us from building the relationships necessary to mobilize and form the sorts of coalitions necessary that really challenge and impact the status quo. Uh, the most meaningful example where black and brown folks have come together in, in the last 40 years that people really rely on and, and draw back on was when Harold Washington was elected. Uh, but even then, that was only with 37% of the vote. So th not only is there work to do, but that work is already being done. And you see it on display when you hear about the, the losses and tragedies of people like Vanessa Gann or uh, George Floyd, uh, people of all hues, particularly in the black and brown community, come together in solidarity and stand up against the oppression responsible for these sort of senseless killings and the things going on. Let's, let's talk a little bit. Let's Let's talk a little bit about that collaboration. Laura, in Chicago, we saw what a black and brown coalition could achieve when Mayor Harold Washington was elected. How did that co coalition come together, and what could the current mayoral administration do uh, to learn from that period? Well, the, the mayor, Harold Washington, when he ran for mayor, he understood uh, that he had, it, he had to reach out, that he was he, especially he, he, he was in a three-way race with two white candidates, he had to reach out and build a coalition beyond his African-American base. I think that was a natural for him. I, I worked in his administration. It was a natural for him because that was the kind of politician he was. And so he didn't get, as, as Todd points out, he didn't get the, the numbers that, you, would, that you, would, you might like to see him get, but it was a start. Where there was a major breakthrough was when he, after he had been in office for several years, and he was, as you know, was fighting the Vidoliak at Berg 29, which had the 29 aldermen who had all white, who had control of the city council. In order for him to break that logjam, he needed to get some of his, some additional aldermen in place. There was a special election. He was able to su support and help uh, bring in two, two Latino aldermen that helped to, to help begin to break that, that voting logjam that he had. 
and, and, and representation, of course, is so important for, for both black and brown communities. Unfortunately, we're going to have to end it there for Latino Voices, but the conversation continues in, in black voices, including anti-black racism in Latino communities. So don't forget to tune in to, into Chicago Tonight Black Voices tomorrow night with Brandis Friedman at 6 o'clock for this very important conversation. Our thanks to Sylvia Puente, Berto Aguayo, Laura Washington, and Todd Belcor for joining us. Today is El Día de la Virgen de Guadalupe, a day that commemorates an event that was critical in the history of Mexican Catholicism. Let's take a look. The image of La Virgen de Guadalupe at the Shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe in Des Plaines was temporarily removed on Friday to encourage pilgrims to celebrate the day at home. The image of the Virgin will be returned to the Shrine on Sunday. Now let's go to Brandis Friedman and, and tackling food insecurity in a conversation recorded earlier. The demand on food banks and pantries has increased dramatically during the COVID-19 pandemic and the demographics of people facing hunger have also changed. Joining us to discuss the work they do to combat hunger are Wendy Daniels, coordinator of the Breakthrough Fresh Market Food Pantry in East Garfield Park, and Julie Yurko, CEO of the Northern Illinois Food Bank. Thanks to both of you for joining us. Wendy, let's start with you, please. What kind of demand have you experienced so far this year? Well, it has been overwhelming. Um, at the start of the pandemic, back in March, we had seen our numbers triple. Uh, we were normally serving about 300 guests per week, and we've seen that graduate to about 900 individuals and families that we've had to serve. Um, since then, it's trickled down just slightly, so we're doing about half of that, but the numbers have been astronomical. Julie, what about you? What kind of demand uh, or increased demand have you experienced? North Illinois Food Bank covers the suburbs of Chicago, and we go out into the rural areas. And we, see, we too have seen a dramatic increase, over 50% increase in need. We're providing more than 300,000 meals every day through our, our network of 900 food pantries. And Wendy, you know, how have the demographics uh, of the clients that you're serving, how have, how's that changed? Well, I, I think that has been the biggest shock to us. Um, over at Breakthrough, we're located in East Garfield Park, right on the west side of Chicago. And so predominantly we serve an African-American community. Um, since the pandemic, uh, our service looks more like Asian, Hispanic, um, Caucasian, African-American. And I would probably say uh, where we were about 95% African-American, we're probably about 50-50. So 50 percent African-American and then the other 50 percent would uh, encompass all of those other different cultures. So it's it's just been a real eye opener. And then as far as like those individuals that we're serving, uh, we were serving mostly single family homes, um, some grandmas, some grandpas. Now we are seeing corporate individuals, two family homes, folks experiencing homelessness. So it just runs the gamut and it, it, it's just been very eye opening for us. Julie, is there a, a stigma associated with food insecurity? There is a stigma. I think most folks are ashamed to come forward and say that they need a little help, that they don't have enough to feed their families. 
And one of the things I would love your viewers to know is that we all need a little help every once in a while. And the pandemic has been a great leveler. We have seen so many families, working families coming and needing some support and we are here for them. We have distributions every day and we also have a hotline that they can call and they can be connected to food stamp or SNAP benefits as well as we can share where the next distribution is going to be. And I think uh, we'll and I think we'll uh, allow folks to have access to that on our website, of course. But Julie, you also um, you encountered a family uh, who was experiencing, you know, sort of those feelings of embarrassment and shame um, at needing that food insecurity. What happened there? Yeah, we I was at one of our distributions. We have pop up markets where we serve anywhere from a thousand to two thousand families on a Saturday. And I was at one of those and I was welcoming families to us and went up to a minivan and there were these three beautiful children in the back of the car, all smiles and I'm chit chatting with them. And I turned and I looked at the mom and she was a beautiful young mom, but the look on her face of sadness, of desperation. And yeah. I started talking with her and she shared with me that she um, is a pastor's wife and that they have never needed help before. And she said, they believe so strongly that God always provides. And she said that morning, her husband looked at her and said, maybe by going to this distribution, this is how God is providing for us. And I said, absolutely. And I said, we are so glad you're here and you're gonna get beautiful, fresh produce, proteins, dairies, and you're gonna have enough to feed these beautiful children for the next week. So no shame, absolutely no shame. We all need a little help every once in a while. Absolutely. Wendy, why is getting nutritious food to people important, particularly in your community in East Garfield Park? Yeah, sure, that's a great question. So um, the individuals that we serve at Breakthrough, we are really committed to serving the whole family and creating a good sense of well-being all around. So we want to deal with that spiritual, that mental, as well as the physical. So we definitely find when our families are getting nutritious food, those things she spoke about, that fresh dairy, that great produce, uh, those quality frozen meats, when people are fed, um, it definitely helps to attribute to those mental and spiritual aspects of their life. So we definitely want to create the best environment, give the best food possible to our families so that it can be well-rounded individuals. And, and Julie, we're almost out of time, but you know, is it fair to say that people think that hunger or food insecurity is, is more an urban problem, that the people in the suburbs are, are better off for some reason? Yes, I think most people attribute hunger with homelessness and an urban problem. And yet we know not only in Northern Illinois, but across America, that the hunger need in the suburbs and the rural areas is also very prevalent. Like I mentioned, we're talking about a half a million people in the suburbs of Chicago. That's one in six of our kids who are hungry in the suburbs of Chicago. So hunger is everywhere. And thankfully, through the food banks, through the Feeding America Network, we also have help for families in every county across the United States. Okay. Wendy Daniels and Julie Yurko, thank you so much for joining us, and thank you for the work you're doing. Thank you. And if you're looking for resources, we've got links to both organizations on our website. There's more Chicago Tonight Latino Voices right after this. The 2019 proposal to designate parts of the Pilsen neighborhood as landmark districts was rejected earlier this month by the city's council zoning committee. Those in opposition say the effort to protect historic buildings will result in displacement of longtime residents. In tonight's throwback, we look at the state of gentrification and historic preservation in Pilsen in 2005 with Chicago Tonight's Eddie Arruza. Chicago's Pilsen neighborhood is almost as old as the city itself, and to this day, there are residents who live, work, and worship in buildings that date from the late 1800s. But not far from these historic structures, there's more and more of this, new construction replacing the old. We want progress. I mean, we want some of these buildings to be renovated and to benefit existing families. The challenge is the affordability. Uh, and with development going on around us, that's becoming a greater challenge. 
Much of the gentrification here is being generated by the expansion of the University of Illinois just north of Pilsen. But an incursion is also coming from the east as the development of the South Loop extends into Pilsen. Community activists say the working class Mexican community, along with the historic nature of the neighborhood, are being threatened. The face of affordable housing now seems to be make it affordable for teachers, uh, firefighters, police officers, which that's good, but at the same time, we need affordable housing for working families, uh, the bus boys, the service employees, people that work in our uh, retail stores here. They need affordable housing as well. A UIC spokesman says the university has no plans to continue development into the heart of Pilsen, but they can't speak for private developers. Anywhere where there's any kind of large scale uh, investment taking place, whether it's on the whether it's a large hospital, a large university, or even the city, that then speculators try to invest in the area surrounding it. So we don't deny that them kind of investments aren't taking place because they are. I think to the university and private developers is we're saying to them uh, that if you're gonna do some development in this neighborhood, there's gotta be set aside affordable units for our residents. And now to Brandis Friedman with what's on tap for tomorrow. Ugo, we've got another great show planned tomorrow. We'll continue the conversation with both black and Latino leaders about unity between the two communities. Plus, the president of Governor State University, a throwback to Fred Hampton, and the inspiring story of a champion archer. That's tomorrow at 6 on Chicago Tonight Black Voices. Now, Ugo, back to you. Thanks, Brandis. Tomorrow, Lyric Opera of Chicago is having a virtual concert unlike anything they've ever had before. Arts correspondent Angel Edu takes us to Lyric Opera, which opened its doors for the first time since June, to film this virtual concert. Today I had the joy of recording a, a duet, El Día Que Me Quieras, with David Portillo. And he's a beautiful tenor, and um, we've never sung together. So to have that experience was, was really beautiful. Hosted by Puerto Rican soprano Ana Maria Martinez with musical accompaniment by Craig Terry, for the first time ever, Lyric Opera of Chicago is hosting a concert entirely sung in Spanish in Pasión Latina. Featuring students from the Ryan Opera Center, each singer tried to choose songs that were best reflective of their talents. For third-year baritone Ricardo Rivera, it was about singing songs that reflected his upbringing in Puerto Rico. These were songs that were danced to almost every night in these uh, places. And they're recognized immediately uh, by people of uh, maybe one or two generations prior to ours, um, immediately. And it's almost like a, like a sense of going back home. Originally from Oaxaca, Mexico, first-year soprano Denise Velez has been a practicing opera singer for the past 11 years. While it's a virtual first for Lyric in more ways than one, the artists say they're grateful to bring the community together during this time with their love for the language. Did Pasión Latina, Latin passion, um, and I think that there's a lot of joy and strength in, in passion. Some will be familiar, some will be new discoveries, and I think the language will be the common thread. And I've, I've always thought that a person's favorite word, or the one that will open their heart the most, is their own name. And I think after that, it's their mother tongue. So I am very hopeful that everyone will rejoice who speaks Spanish in this 
presentation, but also those that don't speak it, they'll, they'll still see the beauty and hear the beauty in it. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Angel Ito. Pasión Latina premieres tomorrow night at 6 on the Lyric Opera of Chicago's Facebook and YouTube channels with closed captions available in both English y Español. Visit our website for more information. And that's our show for this Saturday night. Be sure to check out our website for the very latest from WTTW News and be sure to join Brandis tomorrow night for Chicago Tonight Black Voices with a continued conversation about unity between Chicago's black and brown communities. And we leave you tonight with some more of the Lyric uh, Opera's Passion, Pasión Latina performance. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, Latino Voices, I'm Hugo Balta. Thank you for sharing part of your weekend with us. Buenas noches. Closed captioning for this program is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, pleased to give back to the community through numerous charitable initiatives.